Congressman Adam Kinzinger, he's found some time in his busy schedule. He's on the line right now. Congressman, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. How's it going? Everything's going great. How are you doing this morning? That's <laughs> amazing. I couldn't be any better. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, I, I, you're saying that with a cup of coffee in your hand right now. Am I right? Yeah, I'm already one down, one to go here soon. Good to know. Good to know. Hey, <laughs> lots of things going on in the news cycle. I know how busy you are, so let, let's get right to it. Man, I, I see that you have been tweeting and, and commenting extensively on what's going on in Syria. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, look. Go ahead. Well, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge tragedy. And, you know, this is, uh, part of me just feels kind of a little defeated because it's been, you know, four years since the major chemical weapons attack that led to the so-called red line. And, and then this has just continued. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I think uh, Assad decided to Trump or to uh, test President Trump with this attack. And, uh, and I think it's only going to make things, make things worse in that area. Yeah, you've got, uh, what, over 35 people dead, many of them children. Um, really, no doubt about this, just being an attack on his own people. Well, that's right. And, and you know, here's, I think, the frightening thing about it is, is, you know, the chemical weapons attack is horrific. Watching kids literally struggle for their last breath is horrific. Um, but, you know, not since World War One have we accepted the use of chemical weapons on a battlefield. I mean, you know, Adolf Hitler on the battlefield, obviously not against his domestic population, but on the battlefield, didn't even use chemical weapons as evil as he was. And, uh, and I think where I'm more concerned is we have now accepted the use of sarin gas and weapons of mass destruction, which this is, uh, as an everyday thing. So I think the Western world has to stand up and, and uh, inflict punishing airstrikes against the uh, Assad regime and basically making it clear that the use of chemical weapons is going to cost you far more than it can possibly gain you. And the fact that, you know, you, you mentioned this before, the, the, the red line, the, the famous red line that was discussed and then completely ignored later on, leading to some of the things that we're seeing. And then and yesterday, I, I see many of the same pundits who, you know, uh, you, you could, I guess, expect this from. This, this was Trump's fault that this happened. Right. Well, I mean, look, I think there's plenty of blame to go around. I think it was a mistake of the administration to say the removal of Assad is no longer our policy. You know, obviously Obama said it was our policy and didn't do a dang thing about it. Um, you know, Donald Trump, I think in just saying it's not our policy, you can send a message to Bashar al-Assad. But let's, let's be clear. I can be somewhat critical of that. The, the, the blame rests totally in President Obama's lap. In 2013, he decided to go take a walk in, in the garden with his chief of staff and said he wasn't going to attack, despite the fact that this attack was ready to launch in about five hours and we had our allies on board. Um, it would have been an attack decapitating Assad from his fielded, fielded forces, so it would have taken out his ability to command and control. And then we would have said, okay, well, there'll be more if you do it again. It was the right move to do, and he went out on a walk and decided he wanted Congress to co-own whatever the result was, so he decided to come to Congress, even though he doesn't need to. And as a result, this whole thing fell apart. And, and continues to have the ramifications, including Russia and China vetoing a resolution in the U.N., which causes even more trouble with it. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a hornet's nest that seems to be getting worse and harder to figure out, not easier. Well, that's, yeah, and that's the point is, you know, back during the red line debate, trust me, there were a lot of Republicans calling my office screaming, you know, Kensinger wants to start another war in the Middle East when I said we have to enforce this red line. Um, but, you know, it was a fact. It was the right thing to do. But people's argument on both sides of the aisle was, if you attack Assad, it's just going to make things worse. Well, we never could have imagined how bad it's gotten. Uh, I, I, I really think it could get almost no worse than it is right now in terms of humanitarian, in terms of ISIS recruitment grounds, everything else. And, uh, look, every day that goes by, the options are less, uh, less favorable. But I think in the least is we have to make it clear that the use of chemical weapons will be met with great damage to your regime. And yeah, and make sure that that message is, is received very loudly and very clearly at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, you know, you use diplomatic, what's called the diplomatic instrument of power. And that is what our preference to use is. That's where you get a negotiated solution, you know, favorable outcomes to all parties. But like what we saw, whether it was with the Iran deal, so-called deal that was really terrible, or whether it was with the attempts to try to do something in Syria by the last administration, there was no threat of power, no threat of strikes backing the attempt to go to the negotiating table. So the other parties had no, they were not compelled to actually get a deal 
they were just compelled to stall, and that's what happened. Spending time with Congressman Adam Kinzinger. I know this is something that's uh, near and dear to your heart. That's fighter jets. What's going on with the Navy strike fighter jets that can't fly? Well, look, I mean, you know, what we have right now is a situation where our military has been underfunded. Um, and, and that's why President Trump's talking about investing in the military is so important. You know, a lot of people throw out the stat, oh, we spend more than the next, you know, whatever, 10 or 12 countries combined. And that's true. I think it should be the next 15 or 20 countries combined. Sure, I don't have um, a problem with that. Right. But, you know, we're also the best paid military. We have the military with the best benefits, which I think is a good thing. And a lot of our military spending, believe it or not, it goes to pay and benefits of the soldiers. So, um, you know, as you have an increase in cost in personnel, which happens every year, you have to increase military spending accordingly to be able to just keep up with operations and maintenance, not to mention investing in next generation technology. So, uh, look, if we want to have a military that when ISIS, you know, cuts off heads, we say we want to go destroy them, uh, then we have to invest in it. Yeah, I'd rather not hear the ground crew go, yeah, we'd love to get you up in the air, sir, but we just don't have the parts. Yeah, the tie rod is broken on this plane. Yeah, that seems yeah. like something the Canadian Air Force might have a problem with, but not the, right. not, not the American Air Force. That's absolutely right. And so I think it's, look, you know, why have aircraft if they can't fly? You know, why have people trained if they're not going to be up to par to do the job? And, uh, and so, you know, personnel readiness should be our number one priority. Uh, equipment readiness should be our number one priority. And, uh, and look, I think the president has a good focus on that. He's put some reformers in the Pentagon. Trust me, the Pentagon needs reform. So I think, you know, it's slow, but I think over time you'll see a much more efficient, effective military where your dollar is spent more wisely to do more damage to more bad guys. And before we let you go and uh, continue on with a busy day, give me your thoughts on uh, Judge uh, Gorsuch and what's going on with that and where it's going to go. You know, look... Uh, it's, it's our senators, you know, Durbin and Douglas decided that they were going to play politics and, and filibuster. Now, keep in mind, even when it was like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Souter or all the left-wing judges on the court, Republicans did not filibuster. That was considered a no-no. They decided to filibuster. So we're going to use the nuclear option in the Senate, and I think it's the right thing to do, but it really is sad. Uh, but look, I mean, each of these left-wing Democrats, uh, their base would be upset with them if they didn't filibuster, so they have to do it to satisfy their base. The good news is we're going to have Judge Gorsuch and I think one of the best conservative judges on the Supreme Court. Well, and just seemingly one of the best judges when I look at, you know, people who, who don't look at it through a partisan lens give this guy huge thumbs up across the board. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Somebody that just is really focused not on the partisanship but on what does the Constitution say and my job is to interpret that and not write it. So what's on your agenda for the remainder of the day? What, uh, what, what big meetings are we going through now? Oh, man, it's, it's uh, all kinds of meetings all day, and uh, usually in 15-minute increments. So well, at least job, and hopefully some people from the district. Yeah, at least you're fired up for it. We can tell that. That's right. <laughs> he's ready to go. He's <laughs> got coffee. He's ready to go. He's Congressman Adam Kinzinger. Congressman, as always, I appreciate you taking time for us. Yeah, anytime, brother. Have a great one. There we go. Congressman Kinzinger, 744, News Talk 1440, WROK. This April, Pottawatomie is seeing fours, four Audi A4s. Play Score A4 on Wednesdays for your shot at a 2017 Audi A4 from International Autos. Over $40,000 in slot play is also up for grabs. Play April 1st through 26th with your club card, then pick the winning plates to score A4.